if you think about human genome, you always think about sort of sequence of nucleotides, letters. But in reality, it's a molecule, and it's a very long molecule. Um, if you take all the chromosomes of the human genome and stretch them, they'll collectively be two meters long. Now, this two meters of DNA needs to be packed inside every human cell. Moreover, even within a cell, there is a smaller compartment called the nucleus, which is about five microns in size, and you need to pack two meters and five microns. So that's a question that we call the genome folding problem. So, so we're trying to understand how the genome is folded in 3D, actual spatial structure, and we're also trying to understand what are the functional implications of this folding. Um, again, genome is not a homogeneous thing. There are genes, there are regions that are where there are no genes, and sort of we're trying to see whether there are some, what's the functional role of this three-dimensional folding of the genome. Um, this folding of the genome is not static. As cells divide, they compactify their genome into dense chromosomes in metaphase and then separate their chromosomes. So genome is opening up after cell division and then closing for cell division. So we're trying to understand all of this now in the context of 3D. So we, another name for this problem is genome in 3D. So genome is not a linear sequence of letters for us as it was when the genome was sequenced, it's a physical three-dimensional object. So historically, uh, people started thinking about uh, the genome folding problem in 1960s, uh, asking a question, so how, do, how is DNA packed inside chromosomes? Because in the microscope, you can see chromosomes. Uh, on the other hand, we know that chromosomes uh, are made of DNA. So the question is, how is DNA wind up inside chromosomes? So again, in the 60s, people put together several models of how DNA uh, molecules actually packed inside chromosomes during cell division. So dense chromosomes that you see in the pictures, this prototypical X-shaped chromosomes. This, so, so these days, we, we start validating these models. Uh, but if we were to talk about sort of genome folding in general, I think we can just go hierarchically rather than historically and look at sort of what's the first level of, of DNA packing. And the first level, so you have lone molecules of DNA, as I told you, two meters of DNA. Uh, the way this DNA is packed at the lowest level, it's wrapped around small barrels. And these barrels are called histone proteins, so it's wrapped around in small histones. And then these histones are essentially like beads on a string. And this provides about five-fold compression. So instead of two meters, now you have about 40 centimeters of this fiber. Um, and so if I were to use this model, so essentially, so if this were DNA, I would start wrapping it into small, into small around barrels, and that would form sort of this beads on a string structure. Still, you have the same problem. Now we have 40 centimeters that need to be packed inside five microns. So that's all that was known until recently, that there are beads on a string. On the other hand, if you look under the microscope, chromosomes are big objects. They're visible in the microscope. And we know that chromosomes have about, so each chromosome has a size of about a few microns. Uh, again, during interface between cell divisions. So what's known about them? What's known on the other side of the scale? So for, for chromosomes as a whole. What's known is that chromosomes are not really mixed with each other. So if I have two chromosomes, this would be my models of chromosomes. In principle, I can mix them completely and sort of they would take the same space. But in the cell, chromosomes are touching each other. Uh, essentially sort of talking to each other and interacting a lot, but nevertheless, you can always say that's one chromosome and that's the other chromosome. So they occupy the whole space, but nevertheless, they are, they are sort of isolated or sort of uh, have their own territories. Again, they, they talk to each other. They're not insulated from each other, but they, but they have what's called chromosomal territories. So that's again known at the scale of a micron. On the other hand, we have this sort of DNA wrapped in beads on a string. These are about 10 nanometer sized, um, 10 nanometer in diameter fiber. So this is 10 micro, few microns. On the other hand, we have like few nanometers. So the, we have three orders of magnitude difference. The question is, how is this fiber of 10 nanometers packed inside these things? Um, so that's the problem that, that people have been largely thinking about and contemplating about sort of for, for many years, trying to develop methods to look inside structures of chromosomes. In contrast to proteins, structures of proteins 
The first structures were solved in the 1950s. Uh, you cannot do X-ray crystallography of chromosomes because you cannot crystallize chromosomes. They're different in different cells and we're interested in their structure only as long as they're inside a cell. If I isolate it from a cell, it will just become a soup of chromosomes of presumably no interest, no interest in structure. So what can be done about solvent structure of chromosomes? Uh, a series of methods has been developed um, at the beginning of the 21st century um, that are collectively called chromosome confirmation capture. So these methods essentially do the following thing. They take cells, add formaldehyde. Formaldehyde essentially glues everything to everything. So now everything is covered by this glue. You can isolate chromosomes from the cells, chop them into pieces, still within this glue, and then two regions of the chromosome that might be somewhere far along this fiber happen to be close in space, they're glued together. So when I isolate them and I chop them, I can now have, I can now, through a series of clever biochemical steps, connect them into a single molecule. These two pieces that are far on the, on the, on the linear chromosome are now going to be connected because they're kept together by the glue. And after I connect them, I can actually identify their nucleotide sequence. Through sequencing technology, I can actually read DNA here and read DNA sequence there. If I do it massively and in parallel, I will get billions of such short reads, and each read tells me that tells me amino acid tells me a nucleotide sequence of one piece of the hybrid and the other piece. Then I sequence this and I can say, oh, from this lattice I can identify that this came from chromosome one and this piece came from chromosome twelve. And that means that this specific region of chromosome 1 and that specific region of chromosome 12 were physically close in space somewhere in one of the cells. So as a result of this method, we get huge maps of chromosomal interactions. Which region of the chromosome talks to which region or touches each region. So that's the end of the experimental part. And that's the beginning of the challenge for us computational biologists. Now the question is, from these big maps, how can I reconstruct three-dimensional structures? It's sort of similar to the problem that people were facing in the 1950s when they were solving the structure of, of DNA, the double helix of DNA. They had X-ray uh, pictures of the uh, DNA crystal, but they had no idea that it, it's actually a double helix. So we now have these big maps of interactions between chromosomes, and from these maps, we're trying to understand how, this, how the genome is folded in space. So essentially, it's an unsolved problem. What, I, what, what I'm telling you about, so the structure of, 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 of chromosomes, it's still an unsolved problem. So we only get in first, we're making first steps toward understanding the structure and solving the structure. So what we understand so far, what we understood so far is that this, that's not going to be a solid structure like a structure of, of proteins because these molecules are very long and flexible, these are going to be ensemble of structures rather than a single structure. And in this ensemble, chromosomes would have very different shapes. But nevertheless, we are trying to understand what, what are the principles of folding of this ensemble. So what forces drive folding of chromosomes? What organizational principles drive their further folding when they divide into, into um, so folding into, into metaphase chromosomes? And sort of, and then segregation of chromosomes. So essentially, we're trying to bridge between biological question on one side and the question in polymer physics on the other. We're trying to, to characterize this polymer state of, of chromosomes. We still don't know what's the practical application of this. That's largely a fundamental problem. But frequently, when you go to a museum, you see a big stand where they say, oh, DNA is folded in, in chromosomes in this way. First, it's, round, it's wound like that, then it's wound in some other way. We really don't know. And that's what, that's, that would be the end product of this project. It's actually a stand in a museum where we can actually say how chromosomes are folded. And maybe another stand where we can actually say how they are condensing and decondensing in response to various stimuli. Because again, chromosomes are active. Cells need to sort of uh, need to have access to this information. Um, and how they are folding and unfolding during cell cycle. So this brings me actually to the question again, sort of you should realize that, um, so DNA is not just a material, 
So it's a material from the polymer physics point of view, but from the biological point of view, this is information. So this information needs to be accessed. So it's like, you know, how do you arrange files on your computer? So you arrange them such that you can access files by uh, when you need them. So, so the, the idea is that this folding of chromosomes might be able to provide cells with some advantage in sort of packing things compact, but also being able to achieve sort of rapid access to, to, to regions that it needs to, to, to access. And when it accesses and needs to read, it may also want to open it up. So the question is, how can I fold this, this fiber such that it's compact, but easy to open up and easy to search through? Um, so we're trying to see how, how sort of evolution sort of solved this problem. So the main, the main challenge with this is that is our limited understanding of, of intracellular organization. Um, it's not really a technical challenge. Again, these methods are rapidly developing, uh, producing lots of data. Uh, so it's really the challenge of integrating non-trivial biology with cutting edge physics. Uh, polymer physics has been largely interested in systems that are different from, from DNA. Though again, everything we do is sort of is based on 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 is on the foundations built by 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 polymer physics, but it's really sort of new biology and new physics. So uh, we sort of in terra incognita, we would like to to learn this all sort of how how chromosomes are organized, uh, but we just need time and ideas and sort of uh, uh, sort of just. Uh, looking, looking into this data, building new models, sort of, well, I don't think it's, it's something that can be solved by more powerful computers or throwing millions into this or, throw, or sort of making Los Alamos projects out of that. Uh, I think it's just sort of a, a question of sort of gradual integration of various sources of information. I think that might actually be one of the keys, is sort of integrating lots of different information. Integrate microscopy data on one side, this chromosome confirmation data that I told you about on the other side. Um, also learning about other structures because beyond DNA, there are lots of other stuff in the, in the nucleus. There are lots of other proteins, molecules, stuff is moving around. We understand very little about dynamics of molecules inside. It's really sort of an exciting biophysical problem. It's a problem that, that sort of studies in biophysics were contemplating about in like 1950s. And the uh, first hypothesis were put forward in the 1960s. And only now we can actually test this hypothesis. We can sort of open textbooks and say, ah, this model actually works, but this one doesn't. And before we were unable to do this because first we didn't have data on how things are folded. And second, we didn't have powerful enough computers to actually sort of fold DNA the way it's folded or people hypothesized it's uh, the way it's folded and compare what we get in simulations to what we see in the data. So now we actually have tools to, to answer these questions, to sort of tr try to build mechanistic models of how genome is folded spatially rather than in a boring way, just as a linear sequence of letters.